Hi, good evening. <clears throat> uh, welcome to the Art Speak 2018-2019 uh, lecture series. Uh, this is an interdisciplinary program presented by the Department of Fine Arts, uh, History of Art, and English and Communication Studies. Um, our series this year is on the theme of the artist and the new muse. Um, this year we've invited contemporary artists to come and talk about their work, um, as well as to discuss some of their inspirations and influences. Um, other Art Speak programming that we've done this year has included a number of um, gallery talks, uh, where we meet with gallery uh, artists directly in the gallery to hear about their shows that they're producing, and uh, numerous studio visits. Um, we also have had a few exhibitions on campus. We had a show of Gideon Box paintings in the fall, um, upstairs in D6. And in about two weeks, um, Texas-based painter and I believe a former uh, bellwether artist, uh, Dana Frankfurt, will be showing her work uh, in the D6 gallery as well. Um, and there'll be a, a lecture in conjunction with that show. Um, next month, we're working with um, the English and Communication Studies on the Colloquium on Collaboration. This will have a presentation with uh, poet Denise Duhamel and visual artist Michelle Weinberg. Uh, and finally, in April, um, artist Nathaniel Mary Quinn will be giving the final lecture here in, uh, for our uh, spring semester here in uh, Katie Murphy. Uh, we want to thank uh, Troy Richards, the Dean of the School of Art and Design, uh, to Patrick Nicely, Dean of the School of Liberal Arts uh, for their generous support and for their continued commitment to this program. Um, also to the Student Faculty Committee for making this possible. Uh, also, we want to thank Julia Jaquette, the Chair for Fine Arts, David Drogan from the History of Art, Rachel Baum, Associate Chair of Art History and Muse uh, Museum Professions, and Amy Lemon, Chair of English and Communication Studies uh, for their support as well. Our speaker tonight is Ellen Altfest. Uh, she'll probably talk for like 45 minutes to an hour, and then there'll be a brief time for a Q&A at the end of her, of her lecture. Um, after receiving her MFA from Yale uh, in 1997, Ellen Altfest has developed her own distinctive and devoted approach to figurative and representational painting. Uh, the artist and writer David Humphrey observed that Altfest's, Altfest's paintings celebrate the way objects become engulfed by their surroundings and how the simple act of identification multiplies and transforms. Uh, Altfest was born in 1970 in New York, where she lives and works. Um, in addition from graduating from Cornell and Yale, she attended the Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture in Maine. Um, Ellen was awarded a studio space at the Marie Walsh Sharp Foundation and has had a numerous uh, residencies, including the one um, at Marfa, Texas, the uh, Chinati Foundation. Um, Ellen's led an artist workshop at the Kyoto City University of Arts in Japan. And since her first solo exhibitions at the Bellwether Gallery in New York in 2002 and 2005, Altfest has had exhibitions at White Cube London, and her work has been featured in exhibitions at the New Museum, the Venice Biennale, and at MK Gallery in England. Uh, she has a show up right now uh, green spot at uh, White Cube in Hong Kong, China. Uh, we're really thrilled to have you here. So thanks for coming and talking. And let's give Ellen a warm welcome. Hi. I'm really happy to be here um, at FIT. And um, Thank you to Stephanie for inviting me. Um, it's nice to be talking about my work in New York since um, I, you know, work here. <laughs> I'll talk into the mic, okay. I just said thank you. 
Okay. Um, I have a button pressure. Okay. So um, since uh, putting this together, um, Julia Jacquet asked for um, my influences, which I um, have included. So that might push it to closer to an hour. But that was really fun for me to do, to, th to look back on all my influences. And um, um, starting off, I think um, I found after in grad school and after grad school that I didn't really have that many influences. Or I, I was looking to New York. I wanted my work to be contemporary. And I was looking to New York, and I wasn't seeing a lot of realist paintings at that time. Um, and it, there, just, there was just such a small group that um, I didn't really n have that many role models. Um, I mean, there was like Balthus or something, but he was near death, and there weren't that many. That, that wasn't somebody I was seriously influenced by. But um, I think that I kind of started painting after I went to Yale and I started painting the landscape more as, it, it, for me, it was kind of a small act of rebellion because I knew that that wasn't what people were doing. Um, and I kind of wanted to do, to do that. I think that, I, I mean, I had a, a, a real connection to nature, in part maybe because I grew up in New York and I was deprived of it. So when I finally was united with nature, found myself in nature, I thought, oh my god, this is amazing. So, um, so even though I wanted to be contemporary, I kind of went in this other, almost like the opposite direction, but I thought, um, I had this idea that if I was true to who I was and made work to the best of my ability, it would come out and be unique to me. And um, if I ask the question, you know, how can I be contemporary, or how can I make work that's contemporary, that somehow I would find the answer. Um, so this is an early painting. OK. And um, I think what I really wanted was um, to make work that represented a first person understanding of the world and was really subjective. And so how, that was a question, like how can I make these nature paintings subjective? And for me, like, you know, the idea of the landscape it, in my mind was like a panorama or a, a larger scene. So by coming in closer, um, I felt like that was a more personal because I was determining what was the viewer was seeing um, and what was included in, in a very specific way. Um, and uh, anyway, so this is so this is a a brook, and this is a a first idea of of making a painting my own. So I had I had these two rocks that in my mind were where I was standing, and I had this. It, it sort of began my love affair with the color green somehow. So I um, I had all this nature that was impinging upon this. Um, central space so to me there was a little bit of a psychological quality to that and the overwhelming lushness of of the green but that also felt a little bit claustrophobic um, okay. and an influence at that time would have been um, Birchfield um, you know for I, I noticed that his work has a real personification uh, of nature, like it's a, a there's a the psychology is the the sunflower has a psychology of its own, and I really I really like that and I connected with that, so that was something that I was thinking about when I was making these paintings. So this is I mean maybe this would parallel that um, that painting um, and. I felt like that I wanted to imbue the, or I, I, I sensed, it wasn't like I wanted to imbue the log with a human quality, but that I sensed a human quality in the log. And it was a character, it became a character, like it had that little um, 
missing bark, which looked like some sort of mouth or something, but it wasn't literally a face. It was just, it had a personality um, to me that was almost uh, cartoonish in, in some way. Um, and so I felt like instead of it being like a traditional landscape, it was something more like in between a, um, a portrait and a still life. And I've always sort of considered myself a still life painter. If, if you even, uh, even when I'm painting a figure. So, um, and I just wanna say that I, all these paintings, I like the idea of working in an indirect light so that I work only from natural light and 100% from observation. Um, but I like, I like um, indirect light because it's about a, a many moments, not just a, a fleeting moment. So, and I thought I'd put this in because it relates to work that I did after this, but this is something that when I went to Skowhegan, I was looking for a rock covered in lichen and I was able to find it right away somehow. And I like, um, I guess I felt like that there, this was sort of on the border of form and formlessness that it could almost fall apart. You know, if I didn't get every piece of lichen in the right place, you know, that it had a very tenuous structure to it. Um, and another painter I was looking at at this time um, was Jane Freilicker. And, and in some ways, it's, it, I'm not, in terms of influences, it's not a literal translation, and I don't think it should be, because I think that um, these things have to go through you, the artist, and come out as your own. But I feel like I was really, I've always loved her work and there's this, just a sensitivity in it and the humanity of the thing and the, and the mood. And I think that that's what I wanted in my work. I, I wanted there, I, I, or I, connect, I, I felt like that there was in my work this, this mood. Um, so, uh, so that's what I connected with in, in, this, in, this, in her work. And if you, you kind of see, like, I was also, I brought this driftwood back from um, Connecticut, I mean, uh, from Maine, and it was also kind of a character, but there's this idea of forcing a connection between the, the um, a natural object and an urban environment. And I did that through color, you know, since it's all gray, but I also, I also felt like, um, that, that that was a metaphor. I, I think that a lot of my paintings were kind of coming to terms with, you know, being an artist in the studio and being this like wild thing, like a human being and being in this urban environment. Um, and I think I was also missing, missing nature so that I was thinking about that when I was um, making that. And this is another, um, another painting in, in that series. And my first, this was, I guess this was my second show at Bellwether, um, and it was in Chelsea. Um, but yeah, and I, I think that um, it's this feeling of being on the inside, looking out, and trying to bring these two things together, the, um, uh, you know, the, the light, the bright light of, of the, you know, the interior of the studio, and then the, you know, and then the out the scene out the window, and both having both of them in focus, and and forcing the forcing that you know forcing them a relationship between the two of them, um, almost like trying to be in two places at once, or something, being inside and outside at the same time, and I like that tension. Um, and this is a an, uh, another painting. So for me, the. The floor was, you know, definitely, I chose that floor. I mean, that's not the type of mark my painting makes. I'm not that type of acrylic painter that splatters, but I like that it was like a clear sign, like that this is nature in a studio. Um, and, and I like the relationship between the two logs. Like I felt like there was some sort of intimacy happening, but then you can, your mind can go to these, you know, narratives that aren't ne necessary for other people to pick up on. Um, so this painting 
uh, green plant is, um, I felt like was kind of like a self-portrait. <laughs> um, I, I sense the similarity between my hair maybe and the plant. Um, and I like that it was all green. I'm, I think that this is, uh, you can sort of tell, I paint um, one to one scale. So the thing closest to me is um, the actual size and everything is always in focus. So you can only tell that something's behind because it's smaller, not because it's blurry. And I, I do think that there's a difference between uh, the way the eye sees something and then the way the, um, the, the camera sees something. So I often will, if I t give a talk, people will say, oh, well, why don't you just paint from a photograph? Because it's sort of like, this will save you all this trouble that you're going through if you just did that. And I mean, there's such a difference, you know, between, you know, the amount of information that there is in a photograph versus what you see and how things change. And I could notice something I notice things as the painting evolves that I wouldn't if you, uh, if I was just responding to this black thing, which to me is kind of a little bit boring. I mean, I I, I think that you one could an artist can be stimulated by a photograph, but I'm just not that I'm just not that artist. <laughs> so so I had gone on this um, residency and and. Um, I, it was in, in California and there were all these tumbleweeds uh, like rolling around there. And that was very unusual for me. I was like, what is, what's going on here with all these tumbleweeds just you know, going past the Walmart or whatever? And, um, and then at the end of the residency, I was like, actually, I want, I want to take one of these and, um, um, and paint it. So I, I packed it up and I shipped it off and I, um, this, this was actually in my studio when I had a sharp studio, and at that time it was in Tribeca. So you had this really old kind of industrial space, and I, I, I felt like that this was like a perfect expression of what, that, what I was talking about, of bringing something that should be moving and putting it in the studio and, 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 fix, and having it fixed in one place. And... Um, and I like that it still possesses that, mo uh, like that feeling of motion. And I also feel like that there's kind of almost like an anxiety. Like I felt like there was an anxiety in making this painting because, because just like that rock painting, um, it, it's really um, if you if you don't get, it has a very tenuous hold on form, so it could easily fall apart. Um, structurally if you get these things out of place but I felt like I was constantly losing my place while making it and um, so I felt like I felt like this was almost like captured a certain anxiety also so I kind of I wanted there to be a, a, a psychological or I wanted these paintings in, in part what I was talking about before being personal um, I wanted them to have a, a psychological um, quality, or, or that's just what they ended up um, having. So, and that's a detail of, of the painting. I think I worked on that for about seven months, and it's pretty big for, compared to what I do. So, I was, I sort of, when I was making this other work, I felt like there was always this discussion that was saying, wow, like your, your work is so um, detailed and you could just paint anything. Like you could paint a Coke can and you have this look to your paintings, so you can make it your own or, or whatever. And it was all about it being a technical feat. And I felt like I felt kind of misunderstood. Like I felt like, well, my paintings do, I, I am choosing these specific things that all have a common quality and people aren't, aren't seeing it. And I felt a little bit frustrated. And at the same time, I felt like I want to paint men. Like it wasn't really rational because I hadn't painted a figure in many years. 
and I didn't really know how. My work had evolved technically, so I didn't know how I would do that. And I also don't really know how to, I didn't know how to paint skin because I don't really paint things that are smooth that well. But I was just like, I wanted to shift the conversation. I wanted to introduce a direct subject matter and I wanted to be like, are you just gonna, like, you know, there is, there is, you know, that, you know, and I wanted to put that out there. And so, I mean, I, so I, I was having this, in, this kind of feeling, this inclination that felt a little bit irrational it wasn't based on any, you know, reason other than I was really curious about it. And so at that same time, there's this artist called Sylvia Slee, um, um, and this English artist, she was maybe in her early 90s, and she had this, she was kind of overlooked at that time, and so her, she had this retrospective, but it was on Staten Island, which is not convenient to anyone, and, um, so I, um, got in my, I got in a car, I went out to Staten Island, to the Snug Harbor Cultural Center, and, um, and it's just a fantastic show, and there was, there was just, the, there's so much there that I felt like, there are different ways that you can be influenced by other people, and like, sometimes you just uh, appreciate something, and then, but the best feeling is when, you, like for me, is when I go and I feel like I can take something from this, like I can literally, it's not like I wanna, do the same thing, but like I and I also like I can be critical. Like I'm like, why did she? She clearly isn't interested in this floor. Like why is this floor even? Is there like is, why is it in, even in there if she didn't even like it that much? And that doesn't mean that I didn't don't uh, totally appreciate and love this painting. I do, but you, it's like you're, it's starting to sort of figure out what I want to do for, based on like what I like in her painting and what I don't. What I would, you know get rid of in her painting. So and there's something just so overwhelming about this painting. I could just talk forever about this painting. But anyway, so, um, so I was just thinking about that. And I was thinking also about like a painting. It was important to me that this was by a woman because, I was, because you look at a lot of paintings and you see like Tom of Finland or there's so much gay men. There's so many gay men out there, which is fine. But as a woman, like the Tom of Finland stuff is like, it doesn't really interest me, you know, and why should it, you know? I mean, I, it does interest me, but it's not, it's like its own thing. So, so this was also interesting to me for, for that reason. And I wanted to learn more about that. And um, so, so I just like went for it. I, this was the first painting I made. And I was like, I'm just gonna go for the, I really like, like, did, did, I curated a show, and I'm just like, I'm gonna put it up here, and I'm just gonna see what happens, like, you know, what, like, what, what the response is, and people, you know, I've been painting plants, you know, for a long time, and I'm like, is this gonna be, you know, people are gonna be like, what, what, what are you doing, you know, with this, with this, so I just thought, okay, this is the most archetypal, like, fundamental part of the, the man, I'm gonna go for this, but actually, as a, a painting problem, I believe that if if the the man, um, I I think that it, if you have a subject that's too interesting, it can almost like ruin the painting, you know, because that you know there's always a push and pull about the you know the subject and the and, and making the and the painting in a way, and I, I never want the painting, the subject to be too dominant, so I felt like I had to really think about, because I had a friend actually, Dana, at the time, Frankfurt, who's having a show here, that, um, and she's like, she was, gave me pushback right away before I even started the painting. She's like, well, just because it's a penis doesn't mean it's an interesting painting. And I, you know, it's like point taken, you know, so I had to kind of step it up, and I, I put the, ben the stool in so that, it could connect to my earlier work. Like I wanted to make it mine. Like I kept having these like visions of Lucian Freud and thinking, no, like that, you know, like I felt like he owned the nude or something. And I was like, I do not want my painting. I, I could only imagine that because I didn't know what my painting looked like. So I was trying to make it, to make it my own. And um, I also liked, I sort of like making the viewer uncomfortable. Like I liked hanging at eye level, and I like really relished seeing men walk up to it and not 
be very, like, you know, not having, it's not that they had a bad reaction, but they, they were uncomfortable, and I liked that. Like, I was like, this is making people uncomfortable. And it's a small painting, I mean, it's huge up here, but it's like, you know, imagine it's like life size, so it's, it's not like the large, it's like, I don't know, maximum 10 inches in any dimension. So, um, anyway, so I had, I, I commissioned, like when I had an opportunity for my gallery to have a, a, uh, an essay written, I definitely wanted a man to write it, like, because I wanted to see what he was gonna say about it and force him to talk about it. And I felt like men definitely, who wrote about the work definitely like kind of even though I had put this direct subject matter out there they just like didn't want to talk about it exactly they still want to talk about looking but um, Barry Shropsky wrote an essay and he said it was like the longest he'd ever stared at a penis and uh, I was like oh that's interesting and then um, Jerry Saltz wrote um, uh, I, this was my favorite thing written. He, he said, the bench the model is sitting on is rendered with the exact same intensity as the penis. This has the disorient, disconcerting effect of making the penis a piece of furniture and the furniture erotic. So I like that. I th felt like that was, that was really true. Um, and this was another painting that I did um, of that same model, and um, and he was my first model. It's a good opportunity to talk about the model. Like my first model was gay, which actually made me feel really safe because I was a little skittish going into this. And it's funny because I I sit so I have to sit so close to the model. So you know, and what I realized is that kind of anything. I mean, for the first day or something, I think I was uncomfortable. But I realized that you know, anything can become normal over time and not that, and doesn't take that long, so. But at the same time, um, I feel like the relationship with the model is important. Like, I feel like we need to be on the same frequency or it makes it a lot harder, more difficult for both of us to, um, to you know, be there together because we are so clo um, close. And he was, um, a, he is an artist and so I like having young artists because I like that, you know, talking to them about art and having that thing in common. I probably don't have that many hobbies or anything outside of art, so it just makes it easier. And, um, and I like hearing about their lives and, and, and stuff like that. So, um, and I think that in this series is, um, you know, I, I don't, I don't want it. The series is, is mostly like sort of like white men who are like not like visibly young or old like I didn't want to be making it about race or I mean I guess it, I, it was I didn't want it to be I just wanted to be about the group that I was most familiar with which were these like white white dudes I don't know but I, I have moved on now I don't only paint white men but um I didn't want it to be about like a really fat guy or a really old guy. Like I wanted it to just be my idea of neutral, which is, which is you know, could be questioned. But um, and and but I mean, ultimately, I think my relationship is with the model in some ways, and not with the with the painting, and not with the um, model. Like you know, like I, it's important for me to have a good relationship with the model to facilitate the painting, but my choices are based on what I want the painting to be. And this is a detail, so that ended up late, sort of leading to another painting. Um, and this is another, I was thinking about how I wanted to represent the, I started off with that penis painting, but I still didn't know exactly what I wanted to do with the male model. So I was thinking about the idea of the model as a still life. Um, and here's a still life. I mean, this still life, it's like one of these things that I shouldn't even include because it's just like better than anything in the world. But um, I, this, is, this was attributed to Caravaggio and I saw it at the Wadsworth Athenaeum when I was at Yale and I went a few times. Um, and I just, I, I have trouble believing it's not a Caravaggio even though it, the attribution is in question. But um, I just love the relationship between the um, fruit and how sexual it is and, and uh, amazing, like how everything's just is overripe. 
th thing. And this is um, a Goya uh, still life uh, sheep in parts, and it's so dark. I mean, this series of, he made like 13 paintings that he kept to his death, and, and they're not all documented. I'm fascinated with them. Um, and I feel like still life in general gets a, um, is not, is underappreciated. Like people think still life is boring, but I think, I don't know where I get this idea, but I, do, I mean, it's like, if you see shows, they, not as many still life shows, historic, even historical shows, so, and I think that still lives can be really um, charged and powerful and interesting and have all a whole different range of feelings, like the last one was sexual and this one is like about death and I don't know, sort of funny, so. I was thinking about, uh, as what I consider a still life painter, and also I was, um, so this is m my idea. I wanted to paint like, you know, un I guess underscore the men as and the still life and put those two, two um, ideas in one show. This is all part of my first show with the men. And while I like this painting on its own, I don't know if they, if I could ever really, if those, if that might be a flawed concept of like the men with the still life. I don't know if I could, if they really connected. I think they worked individually. Um, but I like the relationships of the different forms. Again, like I do have this kind of way of finding the human quality in these things. And, <coughs> and gourds, like when fruit, when it touches, ten, starts decomposing, which I didn't realize. So, so it was kind of a race against time to um, get these, to paint this because it was um, rotting, rotting as I was painting it. Um, so, and, and for me, like, when I started this, I thought it was kind of funny, like, all these gourds, and they're so useless and bright and stupid, but then once you go through, like, the painting process, it's so rigorous that it's kind of always a balance between something that's funny and, and serious. <laughs> it lends a seriousness, the process lends a seriousness to it. So that's a detail. So... Okay, so this is my, the show that I had, my second show with men, and I felt like, okay, now I know what I'm doing. I know what, like, I want these things to be. And, um, and or actually, I don't know, I, maybe this, this is the, no, actually, this is from my first show, but it kind of, um, I don't know. I, I can't even remember what show this is from. <laughs> like, I, it, it, we're leading up to my next show somehow. But anyway, this, I wanted, I didn't, I had sold that penis painting and I wanted uh, a painting of sort of like that in the show. So I um, kind of did the back, the back side of that, of that painting. And I wanted for, you know, a, a butt could be male or female, so, that's in a way the reason I liked the body hair because it was so gender specific and I and it was important to me to make paintings about men because I also people are always saying like why don't you paint women especially men like to say that like why, why not some women in here you know like and because like that's what we would like to see but um, <laughs> I feel like you know I feel like that that kind of deprives me of my own you know, sexual preference or whatever. It's like these two things are not equal. Like there's a very specific point of view and um, it's my point of view and and this is what I wanna paint and what I wanna look at. But it, I guess they're complicated, the images are complicated by the idea, the fact that, that there are a lot of different impulses. Like for me, I'm almost like making fun of the man. Like in, in this one, like I felt like this was a really funny painting. And so it's not straightforward, just like, okay, I, li I like, I'm attracted to men, therefore I'm making these like sexual man paintings. Um, and I think that that could be a little bit confusing for people too, because I, I think that I don't have just one thing to say. Like, I feel like each painting has different things in it and different, and within, within each painting, yeah, there are, there are different impulses. So, um, and I had a fun time making this painting because um, it, the whole hiring process was so ridiculous because I had to look at these guys' butts, like, in order to, you know, it wasn't, 
I don't know. I guess I could have gotten a photograph, but I don't, I don't, for some reason that didn't happen. And we, I had them into my gallery. I, I advertised on NIFA, and um, they came into my gallery and posed. And this, this is, um, uh, this model is a Israeli soccer playing chef. So he was the hairiest. And I think that was something I, I carried forward from Sylvia. I was like, I could never find anyone as hairy as her models. And I was like, there has to be, you know, I loved how hairy, you know, she had one of the model from behind. I was so hairy. So um, that's, that's what I wanted. I think I got someone like that. And this is, um, this was the, the kind of the companion piece in my mind to that painting. So yeah, this is still the first show when I was pairing the men with, and I liked how voluptuous this gourd was, the form of this gourd. So, and then, okay, another influence is um, Philip Perlstein. Um, I did not like Philip Perlstein, but it was like inevitable. Like my gallerist came over and was like, what do you think of Philip Perlstein? And then I was like, I don't like him. He's like, oh, you, you know, you don't like Philip Perlstein? Like, okay. You know, I felt like people don't like Philip Perlstein, and which is fascinating like to me. And, and so at first I was on the don't like Philip Perlstein camp, but then I um, ended up and liking him more. And I love just how the brutality of the cropping, I think is so interesting. Um, and that's something that I, I could identify with. I think that where I have problems with him is when he tries to equate, he puts these like objects in. I like it when it's just the figure, but when he puts the objects in, it, I feel like he's saying like the figure is an object. But the figure is always more interesting. Any figure is always more interesting than any object. So I think it's like a, a failed premise in a way. But I, at the same time, that doesn't diminish my, you know, I came to terms with him and, and decided I do like him. Um, so this is my idea, like, and this is why I put that rock painting in, because in my mind, this is like, I wanted this back to be like a shape, like that rock. And, and this model did have very, very um, interesting back hair. And so I thought, okay, I usually can only get one painting out of each model, so I was like, it has to be the back with this guy, you know? And, and so this was, this was actually um, my second show. And, um, and I wanted to, I even cheated the neck so um, to make it almost like a clean break out of the painting and to emphasize that it was a shape. And I wanted it to definitely be in a, on a traditional like chaise and in the model, not like I had a personal relationship with him, but he was a model as the artist looking at him. Um, and this also changed the scale of my, it became, it, it sort of necessitated, because I was so interested in the pores of his back, it kind of necessitated, it ratcheted up the level of detail um, and slowed me down. And, and, and sort of, I feel like once I get more detailed, it's like I never go back, like, you know, so it, it, I, I got, it, ma making paintings of men necessitated a higher level of, of detail um, and um, so I had a back and I decided that I wanted a front um, and I um, so I was thinking about the paintings as a group you know so like it wasn't a comprehensive every single part of the body but there are certain ones that I felt like were essential and um, I like how the, the uh, figure is kind of blocking the light and also being defined by the light that you can, like you're, he's like an obstruction too. And I like how close he is to the surface um, of the picture. Um, so that's like, oops, that's what I have to say about that. And um, okay, here's another influence. Now, I think that I get a lot of the time and Sylvia Slee was somebody who was reversing the gaze, like that was like her thing. She wanted, she felt like like women had been mistreated by men as the subject. And I kind of don't feel that way at all. Um, I actually, I actually sympathize. Like I'm like, okay, Titian saw this beautiful woman or whatever, and. And he was attracted to her, and he he painted her. He wanted her. He wanted to paint her. And I could, I feel like I feel if anything, I feel inspired by that. But 
when I was, I had this postcard up on my wall in, um, I'm sorry about the page numbers, I don't know why that's there, but um, I had this, this postcard up on my wall and uh, I, I mean, immediately in my mind, I read that like, oh, what if a man, like, I saw that as a man's leg, and then I saw, okay, you know, then there would be a penis there, and then I would do it this way and that way. So in some ways, this is the, the most literal translation, I guess, of, of an image, because I think that usually things need to go through a, a, a full, you know, digestion process. And then I actually later, after making the painting, I went to St. Petersburg where this painting is and was able to take that picture and stand in front of the painting, which was so beautiful. Um, and so that would be, I, I wanted, that was in the second show, so I, didn't ha I did not have two penises. These are, I've only painted three penises total. Now I'm completely over, I'm, I'm like totally happy to pass the penis baton, like whoever else wants to paint a penis, go for it. I'm, I feel like I've hang, hung up my hat with the, I've done it several times. But I liked, um, I liked how the um, leg is, is kind of a, like it's a kind of a, this voyeuristic thing where you're looking through the leg to the penis. And um, I like that intimacy of that, of that interior space. Um, and I like that naming it the bent leg, that's the title, like I, I kind of, I like to shift the focus because I feel like that there's like a power relationship in in any painting, and, and I don't you know as I said you don't want any one part of the painting to have too much power. So like you know if I said you know it's just about the penis, then you're just looking at that. But if I called it the bent leg, it's almost like it's sort of a little bit humorous in my mind, like not acknowledging the you know the elephant in the room or whatever. So I often have fun with my titles. Like, it's matter of fact, but, you know, fun to, to call it that. And um, so this is um, Head and Plant. And I, I think that um, it's sort of what I was talking about with Pearlstein, maybe. I, I just think that if you put, I, I feel like a head was like a, an, ascent, was an essential part of this group of work. Like, I had to have a head. But um, I didn't want it to be a portrait because none of these paintings are portraits. Uh, and so, and that's a hard thing to, I, you know, I never wanted it to be about a specific person or a spe spe specific model. If anything, I wanted it to be, the tension to be a, about, you know, my, it's about my perspective, not about a specific, and not about a specific person. So. Uh, but I, uh, but as I said, I wanted to have a head, so I decided to kind of um, upend the general order of things, where the head is like the most important thing. Like even if you had ten thousand yards of fabric and a purse in the painting, okay, not ten thousand yards, but even if the painting was eighty percent fabric, you would always still look at the head if it's a portrait. So I put the plant in front of the head. And so I put the less important thing in front so that it was, so that you could, um, so you had to sort of look at that at the, at, you know, first, because it's in front, or see it at the same time, or see that first. Like I wanted to slow down the viewer, and that's something I like to do, um, to have a little bit of a disorientation. Because I feel like as soon as you get something and you have that aha moment, like I see what this is, or I see what she's doing, or whatever, then, the, then as a viewer, I feel like you lose interest. So if I see something that has a very clear message, I'm, I, you know, I get, I read it and I move on. And so I'm always trying to avoid having a clear message or a, a thing that I'm saying, or if I see that it's heading in that direction, I'll obscure it. Um, so, so that's kind of, and I feel like it was kind of aggressive to put the head, the plant in front of the head in a way, like, so, so this is, uh, as you were talking about my time in Marfa, I put one that you could see the um, making, which was like, it looks really peaceful, but it was like hell out there. I mean, when I got there, there were 40 mile an hour winds and it's, it became like blisteringly hot. I, I took off my like, basically what was a burqa 
that I would wear every day with like a face mask and hand gloves and everything because I was being photographed and I didn't want to look like a complete freak. But um, anyway, it was, it was, you know, I had, it would like, it had, to, you know, the reason it's that green was that after it became windy, it had like torrential rain floods and stuff. It wasn't what you would expect the desert to be as a New Yorker, which is just seems like dry and calm. I guess not. So that was, oh, that was like my tent after one of those rainstorms. Um, so, but I mean, you know, it's not, um, I think that's even my phone. <laughs> um, I mean, it's not natural to try to keep something in one place for that long. I mean, that's not, that's, you know, this is like being a realist painter, working from life is like a battle against the way things are supposed to be, which they move and they change and you're trying to keep things in one place. So this is, I'm just gonna quickly go through, like I use, I first I made a million drawings and tried out the model with like a, in a million different places. And um, then I moved on, um, just block it out. Um, I started adding things in. Um, I always get the leg, in, I got the flag in first because I wanted to, um, you know, then I, that sets the stage for what's around it. Like, I know what to paint once I get that shape. And I didn't, I wanted it to be specific. Like, I wanted it to just be a shape. So I sort of cut off the ankle and the knee. And it kind of was where I felt like I was heading with my work towards a more abstract place. So I was, at, like, working on, I mean, just work on things over and over and over until it looks right. I don't have a technique. I don't want to be able to see a process or some logical thing. You know, first you do this and then you do that. I do whatever the painting requires. And all the kind of crazy detail happens as a result of drawing it over and over and getting it wrong and doing it again and again. So that's like the finish. And he got that little cut on the, his leg. I don't know if you can see that. And he also got really tan. So I had to sort of go over it at the end and update it in a way but build it. But I liked how just simple it is. It's just, to me, it's just like three bands of color. And this woman from, who was the head of the Chinati Foundation, who was Donald, was like, knew Donald Judd, she accept, she didn't like realism as a thing, but she accepted this painting, which I felt like was, uh, because it was so pared down, but I felt accomplished in that way. <laughs> like, um, and this is, um, uh, armpit. Uh, <laughs> I like this because it's something that, I mean, to me, it's this perfect balance of something that's like really beautiful, like this really voluptuous, curvy form, and then also c potentially offensive, like something, again, that you might not want at eye level because it has that smell, and it's un but I like it, and it's unfamiliar and weird, and um, I, I, I had fun with that. Um, but the model himself um, tore or had a small tear in his rotator cuff after this because I ha wanted it in a specific position. And um, so we had to do these really modified poses until the end. And he, he, his rotator cuff healed, but you know, something that feels good at the beginning becomes uncomfortable over time. So this was a hard pose. And, and lately I've only been doing very easy poses um, and this is, um, the hand, um, and I, I like, it was sort of, um, a co he was a, he rode a bicycle, so, um, his hand was tan, but his leg was, was white, which I ended up loving, and I liked how it looked kind of like a landscape, and, um, had that. I actually stuffed his hand with paper because I had tried to pose with a different model and he had this really long thin hand to keep it in that kind of shape. And he, so he, um, and yeah, so that was the last, the last painting in the, in the group. Um, and um, here's like something I would have been looking at. I got this off the Met Metropolitan Museum site, this is a memling. So I remember think, looking at the knuckles and thinking like, how can I make the knuckles? You know, I, I was sort of like, I, if, if when in not really not knowing what to do, I turned to the Flemish primitives for technical guidance. 
I think, because he um, that everything Memling does is so beautiful and soft. I guess this, even though this is a, a, a high res detail, you can't really see. If you were in front of the painting, you would be able to see the, the fingernails and all of that stuff. But th I also saw this painting in um, before I made the uh, painting of my hand. And I had it, it's funny how influences because I already had the composition in mind and I was like, am I gonna make this painting or what am I gonna do with these last few months? Because um, I had the show coming up and I saw this Wesselman and I was so excited by it. And I was like, I, oh, I'm gonna move forward with this, this painting that I have in mind. And I like how he treats things as a, as a still life. Like I like how his hand is a still life. And I actually like the study a lot better than the finished painting because it has this life to it. I feel the same way with Alex Katz, like the paintings themselves, the studies, I mean, maybe he was working from life. It has this freshness and the color's really nice and air, it has air in it. And, and I, I, like, I like that. I like sometimes, I mean, I think that things painted from life have a, a, have a quality and, and people who maybe are, aren't familiar might say to me like, oh, your painting looks just like a photograph. But I look at other people who, and I, I can, sense when something is painted from life. So um, this is a, a painting of me um, painting outside um, in, in the woods. And um, I, I went, this is, um, I guess this is, this painting is up in Hong Kong right now. So the pain, the show I worked on in Hong Kong took seven years to make. So um, this was a long time, this was like seven years ago, I guess, I don't know. Um, and. Uh, and I, I painted all winter long because the, the tree was falling apart and I was afraid, I didn't know what would happen if I came back in the spring. So um, it was crazy though, I would, never, I would never do that again because it's like, I was able to do it but paint doesn't do well and when it's zero degrees out and people don't do that well either so. I had a whole special get up. So this is that painting and somehow I, I got even more detailed I feel like I need a different s image of this maybe next time, but like, I, I mean, it's just, there's so much, it was the first time where I was like, didn't know when it, people are always like, do you know when it's gonna be finished? How do you know when a painting is finished? And, and, I, and I felt like I really don't, I could keep going and going because there's so much I visual information in nature and yeah, so. Anyway, but I, I, I saw this as like a counterpart to the, to the leg painting. Like just, I wanted, I had a different uh, re relationship with nature when I returned to it. Like I no longer see it as this human thing in the same way. Like I don't see it as a character. Like I was, I wanted, I was more interested in it as a formal element. Um, and so it just felt different. And this is in also, I started, I started making watercolors again. I hadn't made watercolors in a long time. And this is um, a birch tree, and I like that stain on the, um, on the birch tree. And so I was also thinking, I, I, I felt like I had, I felt like if I continued to paint men that I would have um, just like be giving them almost too much power. Like, and I wanted to change what I was doing, so I decided to add fabric. Um, and so I started studying that. And um, I, I, I was like, what, how do I want this fabric to be? And so I was looking at this, which is like the outlier of how sexual fabric could be. Like, I'm like, does, fa does the fabric have a, can fabric be sexy on its own? Or is it only sexy in proximity and relationship to a person? So I was thinking these things and I, I kind of made a pilgrimage to see this painting in the Louvre. Um, and also I was looking at like Shunga, like I love how the paint, the, the fabric like reveals the um, body and conceals the body and how that makes it more erotic. And I just love this. Like I think it's, I, I lo this is Hokusai and um, I, love, I love this Shunga, I'm really into it. And this is, I was also looking at uh, like um, monks, like, you know, mo like old, like Italian Renaissance paintings, monks' robes and the sculptural quality of those. And, uh, you know, they're somber, but there's still these like little peaks of the body, which I thought I really liked. So this is the um, first 
one of the first paintings I made um, in this in this new group. And I think one of the ways that I was I wanted to leave the old uh, painting the old work behind and move towards this new idea. Um, so I think that um, I think that I was trying to have an equivalence with the fabric, like have it be three sections of and the fabric having every element of the painting have equal weight. And, and uh, this is more like what Pearlstein did, like trying to make the, the face, I wanted to still be a, a p part of a, a human being, but to be ambiguous as to what it was. And, um, and Pearlstein, you know, tried to make the hu figure into a human, like a, a human into an object. And I guess I'm trying to do the same thing in a way, but I know that it's a, it's a little bit tongue in cheek because I know that your interest is always going to go to the, um, the human being and, and, I'm, and I can kind of use that also to create a certain tension. Um, so I feel like these paintings are becoming more about, more formal, like more abstract, and, um, more about painting itself. And um, you know, I'm using these like really shallow spaces um, so it's more about the space of painting than a specific place. Um, and so, uh, I think that, that I wanted, you know, first I wanted the objects to be the, alive in themselves, and then I wanted the, the man to be still life objects, and now I'm sort of interested in the painting as the thing it, itself. Um, and I'm also playing with how much of the body can be visible and still be read as a human being. Um, so I'm focusing more on just like light and color. This is abdomen. So I kind of like if you don't know what it is right away because I've eliminated all like the landmarks of a human body. And I, rem I realized that I was had certain crutches with the other men, with the white men because I had, you could see the veins and, and um, m more moles and the contrast between the hair and the skin, which immediately reads as a person. And I, I, I didn't actually know how to paint a darker skinned person or a black person. So it was, it was um, a, a challenge for me in a way. Um, so, and in a way like, delineated a change in the work to, to change the model. And I also, you know, I think that I'm, I'm flirting with the idea of not having a model, um, but I haven't gotten there yet. But this is a painting that I, I, I showed with the other paintings that is a stripe. And to me, there's like something almost like spiritual about this white stripe, like it's very light. And I like that it's already, a because it's an abstract, um, the, the, there's an abstract pattern on it that it's almost like already a painting and it's really close to the surface so it's m very much like a painting of a painting but it's, I like how soft it is and, and light. Um, and I like that maybe there's a sense of a body without there being a literal body in it. And here's a, um, a recent watercolor um, three dots and twine. So I'm thinking about like the the gallery director in Hong Kong was like, don't told my husband like, don't let her lose her humor. So I feel like this one's like a it's really three moles in the twine, but I feel like it's a little bit playful. And this is another um, water, recent watercolor of a blanket, a shoulder, and a um, pillow. But it's really it's just titled um, three shapes. And this is my, um, I'm getting towards the end. Um, this is a, a blanket, it's called um, uh, Three Folds. And I worked for like more than a year on this. I don't know if it could ever, I guess I, sh it's, it seems like it's so close but I could have detail shots of it also. But um, I'm sort of playing with the idea of pushing the model out and like kind of like pushing him to the edges of the frame and make it's kind of it sort of reminds me of of the head with the plant in front of it because you're looking at 
it's, it's the center, the focus of the painting is this blanket, but there is a person, but the person's almost like an afterthought or um, in a way, but you know, obviously the person's essential to the painting also um, and to create attention with how little of the person is in it. And I like, again, like just sort of like that Gord's painting, I like the relationships between the folds and like the softness and the kind of, there's some sort of sensuality um, of the folds. And, and there is like a little bit of a voyeurism with, you know, just this little bit that you see. Um, but there's an aggression in a way to pushing the model to the edges. Um, and really just thinking about, um, yeah, like am I gonna continue working with the model or not? I mean, in some ways these are transitional. They're complete paintings, but they're also heading somewhere and I'm not sure exactly where. And this is, I guess this isn't like perfectly positioned in the frame, but this is a, um, a tantric drawing, which is a full oval when you see it. Um, and this is another way of influence. Um, I, like midway through the painting I was making, which I'll show you, I started thinking about this, like I had this in my mind, these tantric paintings. Um, and I just liked, um, and, I and I never looked at them up until putting this talk together again, uh, after seeing them initially, but um, I had them in my mind as almost like a parallel to what I was doing. And um, I just like the idea of the, the feeling of the intensity of looking over time that people do with these tantric um, drawings and you know how the, uh, how the object or the work itself absorbs that and manifests that and, and the fact that it's a spiritual pursuit. So this is the last painting. I'm gonna show, um, and this is a painting of it outside, so you can see what I'm painting. But I've become obsessed with lichen. This is like kind of a powdery lichen. And, and for me, um, uh, like, I just feel like um, that this, I wanted it to just be, uh, a, I just had a simple idea of it's just gonna be a, an oval in the re fr rectangular frame of the canvas. Um, but I feel like I just was looking at it for so long and something else emerged that's almost hard to put my finger on, but um, I, I, I didn't mean to keep going this long. Like I thought I was done basically in December and then when I returned in April, I just kept working on it through October and it, it became, it ha had started off as this really soft image and it became, I really took it to, you know, I put everything into it. It's a real, that I could, and it's a really small painting. Um, and I think that I've always struggled with how much work my paint, my work takes to make and the, and the, you know, in some ways painting outside in the snow, like I, I think I like that intensity in a way, but also there's a lot of discomfort and, and struggle with it. And that doesn't serve me in a way. Um, and I, and I, you know, I pose a structure on my life and uh, on, you know, how much technology I use and all that stuff. But I feel like I finally, at the end of this painting, like just submitted to, to the process, um, which is something I just aspire to. And people ask me about meditation, like, oh, painting for you must be, I mean, you should never say to anyone, like what you do must be like this, because uh, you know, it's always gonna be wrong. Um, but painting, they're like, painting for you must be this meditation. And I think that to them, that means like some sort of like blissed out state. And I don't, I think that that is possible, but I think it's work to get there or a commitment or I think that meditation, you know, could be part of my process. And I do meditate sometimes, but I think that um, it's also like meditation is a discipline. And um, I think that what emerged in this painting I didn't expect. And I think it has a quality that is something that I wanna pursue um, going forward. So that is the end of my talk and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you.
Um, the hardest part, I mean, the hardest part is just the process, like, is very hard. You know, it's like, I mean, for the last year, I, uh, of my, of this show, for this show that's up in Hong Kong, like, I basically didn't go out. Like, I went to bed every night at, like, 9, 9.30. I got up at, you know, I went, like, my Vegas treat was going to the gym at, like, 6. And that was only because to get me out of the house. So I got to my studio early. Like, I, you know, it's like, I don't know. I think that anyone, I feel like that anyone, most people who have, I think, have a creative practice or whatever, have that type of, there's a certain element of sacrifice where, like, I, I feel like, at least in my case, like, I have to go away and I have to, in order to make my paintings, like, I can't, I have to choose between being social and seeing friends and, and, um, and making my work. So I think that, that it's, I mean, you know, in terms of making a certain painting, like when it's 80% done and like the, like the hardest part probably is like getting the drawing right, which takes like 80% of the time, you know, because it's painting, getting everything in the right place is, is this like my very frustrating, like doing something, realizing it's in the wrong place, painting something, moving it, doing it over and over again. It's like if someone said like, do this job, and then you, and then they were like, no, do it again. And you could be paid the same amount. Like you could be, let's say you're making $50 an hour, and that's a really good job, but, but like you, and then, but your job is to do the same task over and over and over again, like, um, and redo it and try it and retry it you would be really frustrated. So that's a very, can be very frustrating, a very frustrating part of my process. But when it's like, I mean, there are, you know, obviously creative decisions and stuff that I make along the way. It's not just that, but um, what it, when everything is in the right place and, and I can see the end is near because a part of it is like feeling daunted by my own process, I feel happy, like if, you know, usually, like I feel this, I can just enjoy the process of, of making it. But I'm trying to kind of like, you know, get into more, getting into more of an acceptance means of what, how difficult the task is, means like less suffering. Um, so I'm trying to, you know, there's the task and then the suffering that I've experienced with it, and I'm trying to just, through acceptance, like just have a lesser amount, of like, you know, more, joy or whatever the you know modified version of that would be so okay yes hi hi I mean, the funny thing is, is that I don't, I don't think you can separate the marks out. Like, you can't, you can't, like, in a way, like, the marks are just a, uh, you know, I think, I mean, I feel like I didn't choose to be a realist painter. It kind of, it, I just was heading in that direction. And I think it's recognizing what your strengths are and, like, going towards what you do best, in a way. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And so if, and going towards your inclination and then keeping going. But I don't think that like, I think that I wouldn't like, I don't think you can overlay a type of painting. I think it's the painting comes from like, kind of the way you paint comes from is a subjective thing. Like, and, and is, is specific to you. And once you get something that's specific to you and who you are and what your interests are and how you paint, then you're going to be making a good a good painting, but it's not like I ch like I tried to paint like um, 
uh, Velasquez, sort of, like, I mean, in my mind, like, I was like, oh, I love the economy and the brushstroke and this and that, but it's just like, I just, I, I failed, like, I was not going to be that type of painter, like, it never, it just looked, like, sloppy and bad, like, it didn't, you know, so I recognized, okay, this isn't looking good, and I moved in a, di you know, I moved towards more, it's away from that and towards something else that was, so if you just go towards what looks better, <laughs> of what you do, but I don't, I don't think, um, you know, I don't have any specific associations with what realism is or isn't supposed to look like either, you know, like, I, I don't know, so. Okay, anyone else? Yes? Yeah. Um, I think maybe it's like a power dynamic, like the, because the figure is so dominant already, I kind of like, I might sort of um, tamp down a certain, the certain humanity of the, the figure and then amplify an object, the, the personality of an object or, um, I don't know. I mean, but it's natural to me to let, to isolate a certain part of the because I see things through. I feel like I was I I see things through the prism of still life. So it's always natural to me to isolate a certain part of the body, and and like like with that hand, I felt like I had a, a really great relationship with that hand. Like you know what I mean? Like the hand and I were really connected and bonded. So. Um, and I felt like that hand had a very specific personality. So I don't know, that's just how I, I don't know which, I, I think it's just a natural inclination also. Like I always see this, this extreme personality in inanimate things um, and maybe less so in the human person, like body, I'm not sure. Okay, yes. Yeah, yeah, I definitely, I have this, like, desire in my mind to make, like, what is it, is it three poles, three, three poles, three poles, is that right? Yes, like, I want to do something with that, with, like, plants or something, like, I don't know, like, I do have some, people have said the Jackson Pollock thing, but I don't think, I haven't been thinking specifically of that, but I definitely am interested in ab abstract painting, even though, it's more the thought of it than actually like looking at it and being like, I want to adapt this composition into one of my works or whatever. So I definitely, I like, I think that figurative painters always want to, you know, you want to achieve balance. So you're always going towards talking about the abstract qualities in your work. And then I've heard that abstract painters are always talking about how their work, or maybe not always, but you know, might be thinking about figurative things. So it's, you know. All, every painting has both of those qualities in it, probably. Yes? Um, well, I mean, yeah, I, I was, I think it's been a pretty straight path for me. Like I had, you know, I worked in a store and stuff when, when I graduated from college and, you know, I had, I mean, I think that's always a tension to, to, um, I mean, I grew up in New York and I had an, an apartment that was, you know, that was purchased for nothing in 1980 that I was able to move into. So I definitely had an, a, a, you know, the home base, home 
home school advantage or whatever. So I don't know. I mean, I think it's hard, in, especially in New York, to, to support yourself and support a practice. And I see a lot of people going through that, um, uh, that, but I feel like it was like kind of like a straight, like it was like a, a, a build, like, like my first show sold out and, and it just, I just kept kind of going and, and, and it wasn't always like glamorous, but, um, I feel like things, there hasn't been like a part of my career that has been really, really tough. Like it's been a, like this, it's just always been uh, like a, a slow build to, to where I am, I guess, professionally. But. Yeah. Yeah, but I had a pl I had a place to I had a place to live, so that like that helped me. But I um uh yeah I I was always very you know I tried to learn like um like uh, a qua like page I had a job at a page layout place where I was doing that for I wasn't very good at that, but I somehow muddled through that and you know I did some some stuff. Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't think that there is, I have a lot of these models who have a more recent experience with New York being the way it is now um, and how expensive it is and people are moving like further and further out. I have a friend who's, you know, working five days a week and uh, as a security guard and painting in the evening. I mean, I think it's like you have to have that kind of hell or high water like approach where you just have to do it uh, you know, that's that, uh, or you'd be miserable, uh, or th otherwise just like it's not worth it because it's so hard to to live, especially in the city. So uh, I sympathize with people, but I don't think that there there's no career path, you know. I mean, for art, and um, and that's that's hard, you know. There's no there's no way to know how to do it or get ahead. I don't know. Okay. Anyone else? Yes. I mean, I'm friends with some of my models. Yeah. It's really important. And I've, gotten better and better at finding people I get along really well with. Um, I do have, uh, yeah, I, I'm very, like, in touch with a lot of my models, and I really like them and respect them and think about them and hold them in high esteem, high regard, so, yeah, and support them. It's nice, you know, like, it's sort of like, I, sometimes I can even, like, feel like I can mentor them if they're artists and I like their work. It's, it's nice for me to be around them have that energy, you know, yeah? I would like to, you know, make a larger piece. I would go as large as I could, but I don't want it to take 10 years either, so. <laughs> I don't know, I think about Ivan, I should put Ivan Albright in here. You know, he spent 10 years on that painting in Chicago of a door. Uh, that's not what I want. I just don't want that. Yes? I get abandoned. No, I don't know. <laughs> I had a model leave. Um, I, 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 you know, only in the early stages I realized this isn't working. But I don't, yeah, I never, I, you can always, you know, I have to be pretty committed. And I have, like, uh, like years to have my ideas, like, gestate, usually, so. I'm pretty confident when I get go out there that it's going to be a good painting, and a paint is forgiving, so you could just keep working on it, and until it looks good, you know. So, I don't know. <laughs> yes.
Oh, no. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's hard because I do have, like, I, I definitely have, like, some sort of obsessive compulsive tendencies where I want illogically to paint every single thing I see. But then, um, oops. But then I don't, I don't really, um, I don't know. Like I, I also ha want it to have like a certain, there's another way of, my eye is also looking at what the painting itself looks like to see if it, it j jives with what I want the painting. The painting itself has to look good. It can't just look good because it looks like the thing. But there's a way that when I sit down in front of the painting and look at the thing, there's a w something I can see that I can't see just by looking at the painting itself that like I can then see what needs to be done. I mean, I just get a sense like, oh, this painting's not finished, but I don't exactly know why until always, until I'm like <coughs> sitting in front of the object. But yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I mean, I've been encouraged with that, those gourds. Like my friend came over and I had misdrawn a gourd. He's like, actually, I like it better than the way it actually is. And then I was like, okay. And I like left it that way. Like I painted it the way it, had been misdrawn and I agreed with him so occasionally I'll do certain things like with head implant like the head I made the head bigger because it was I was measuring from the plant so I made it the head life size and the plant life size so I do some things like that but I never want to get like that surreal quality that like Lucian Freud has where there's just some weird thing happening like there's some legs sticking out from under the bed for no reason and I'm like why are these here you know like I don't like that so, like, keep it in, like, it looks like it could, plausible for whatever it's supposed to be, I guess. Okay. Oh, one more. <laughs> what? Yeah. I mean, like, right now, I'm in an artist now. Uh, right now, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to figure, it's more like trying to figure out what your next thing is going to be, you know? But I think that the important thing is to keep doing something because you kind of like learn to the next thing from what you've done before. So if you're not doing anything, then there's no, you have to sort of get the wheel turning again. So even though right now I'm like not 100% sure what my next painting is gonna be, I'm making watercolors and those are helping me sort of hopefully figure out what my next painting is gonna be, even though I don't have one specific thing lined up for my next painting, so you just keep, I don't know if you're asking for advice, but I'm giving you advice that you just keep moving through it. But I have, I have, yeah, I have like slow, sometimes slow, like not knowing what to do next kind of feeling. Yeah. Yes. So I have this like, the Ang, the book of Ang, the complete drawings, and I used to like, look at that and sometimes it's, it's useful to, to translate something from two dimensions to two dimensions. So I, I look at, I look through, it's a huge, it's like epic, it's this epic book of all his drawings. And it, it's like you can mine all those ideas that he didn't ex execute and, and I'll, I'll sketch different things from them. I also like go to, yeah, I sketch in museums. I love that. I like that student feeling where you're just forever a student. I, I can especially, you know, go and you, you're, I'm the person who's blocking the painting so other people can't stand it. I, I know I'm respectful, but like I love going and, and trying to absorb whatever's in that painting. Um, I don't sketch on the street or on the subway, um, although I respect people who, who carry that practice forward into their professional lives. So yeah. Okay. Well, thank you everyone. <laughs>